So I think the first thing that we looked at in, in my own system was um, this aspect of capacity, and this would be my definition of capacity for our system. So the ability of people in systems to adapt to change. So two parts of it, both people and systems. And when I look at the people, I just grabbed a clip off um, the internet and you can see three generations there, but not just three generations, the, the older fellow with his, his regular bike, the younger fellow with his 10 speed, but then we look at this newest generation. <laughs> it's not even a bicycle, it's, it's a skateboard. And he's got his toque on and so on. So we've got that aspect. Uh, if we move people ahead, if we don't have the infrastructures, I think we just heard as well, we will uh, largely not be successful. At the same time, if we just have the infrastructure, if we put uh, technologies in, in the hands of uh, people without actually helping the people to understand, we will do a disservice. So this is the balancing act. The um, the teeter-totter, as we might call it. How do we bo move both people and infrastructure ahead at the same time? So um, it must be appropriate for the use, for the specific implementation. Now, it's no use to enforce the technology just because it's state-of-the-art or because it's fashionable. Um, for instance, we, we made the decision that at, at this stage we are not going to introduce voting systems. Now, I do believe, you know, these clickers, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, in looking at our budgets, I don't believe it is the most important thing. It's an advanced option. So it must be affordable, it must be appropriate, uh, it must serve the need of, of the school and of the learners. And then, of course, we also look at maintenance. Um, there are many hardware suppliers. Um, in our environment, we have some who can provide better support than others. So, of course, that is also a very important consideration for us when we choose a specific technology. What will be the support afterwards? Not just technical support, but also how to use it. What we, what we did as a model, which was very successful, uh, was to allow them to bid. Uh, they declared what their prices were, and we then said they could not change their price. Uh, they had to give us their best and final offer, uh, and that was uh, fixed for three weeks. And we then put that on the internet. And so we told all schools and them, so they, for the first time ever, could see what their price was and what the competitor's price was. And so many of them, uh, within that three-week period, when we told schools not to buy, uh, then offered us a different price. Even though they had previously offered their best and final offer, they cut it by, in some cases, 20%, uh, because they knew they weren't going to get any of the market if they kept their prices at that level. Uh, that, I think, was a major success in bringing down the prices to an affordable level that schools were then able to take advantage of. Uh, and that's been a, that framework idea of having a framework contract has been one of the things that's worked really well in a number of different areas. Uh, what I can say is that it should be introduced uh, on the basis of the need of that environment and the need of that teacher. Uh, and certainly when I was advising um, schools uh, in terms of the content that they might go for, it seemed to me absolutely silly that the person who should be responsible for what um, history software was the IT coordinator. Uh, because the history software was about history, it wasn't about computing. So we had created this um, pedestal on which we placed IT coordinators in many of our schools and they were responsible for making decisions about all the different subject areas. You wouldn't go to a, um, an English teacher uh, and ask the question about whether this history book was relevant or not. You might go to the English teacher and say, is the language appropriate to my students, the le level of language in this book appropriate to my students. But the content, in terms of history, you would make your decision on as a history teacher. And in the same way with ICT, you should be making your decision 
based on the quality of what that would give you and enhance your lessons, not on its value as an ICT tool. You might go to your ICT coordinator and say, will this work on our system? That would be perfectly acceptable and one thing you would be asking, but it would be silly for you to ask, is this a good history program? Because what does the ICT coordinator know about history? Well, one thing that we did is we went around starting last November and December and visited other schools in the Detroit area. Uh, whatever brand of interactive whiteboard they had, we visited schools in three counties and at every level and different brands to just see. And, and I learned a lot about not just the differences between brands, but some of the good things to do and some of the bad things to do. I mean, one thing we saw, regardless of brand, is that a lot of interactive whiteboards are just mounted too high for people to use. And um, it's because of that, and it's hard to mount it at the correct height because people are all different heights. So we really insisted on getting a mount that adjusts vertically, and um, that's something we didn't see in many of our neighboring districts, and I'm looking forward to that.